Hi, I'm Hank Green, this is Crash Course, and today I want to explore two sites of knowledge production in Europe during the medieval period. This is the story of the cathedral and the university. First, let's agree to call the general time period in Eurasia and North Africa after the birth of large states, but before colonial empires, the medieval. A middle age that lasted from roughly CE 500 to 1400. So we got our working definition established. Across a large part of the medieval world, people traded knowledge and many folks practiced different forms of humoral medicine and alchemy. The majority of these explorations of nature were conducted by individual elites, nobles and other rich people who happened to take an interest in the world around them. In a few places, however, knowledge production was highly centralized. As we've seen in Baghdad, Delhi, Beijing, and Bologna, lots of medieval people were making knowledge systematically. The north of Europe was a different story. Until roughly 1100, there were relatively few places of knowledge making. Monasteries and abbeys had special rooms called scriptoria, where monks copied manuscripts by hand. But the biggest places where knowledge was made were the Gothic cathedrals. Cathedrals were great stone churches that took years, sometimes many decades, to build. These weren't simply places to go on Sunday to worship. A cathedral was the seat of a bishop, or regional church leader, and the administration administrative, spiritual, and educational center of the bishopric, or diocese, the district under the bishop's control. And if you wanted to go to one of these places, that didn't make you a Christian, just like going to Taco Bell doesn't make you a taco. And unlike castles, cathedrals are still used today for their original purposes. Choosing a site for a cathedral was high stakes. While secular rulers paid for cathedrals, bishops often chose where to build them. This redrew the map of Europe and made some cities vastly more important. Once a cathedral was there, there, a city grew economically. As populations grew, bishoprics split, new cathedrals were needed. While the first cathedrals date back to Constantine the Great, the high age of cathedral building lasted from roughly 1000 to 1500 CE. This was an era of frantic economic growth in Europe. The French, for example, built 80 cathedrals between 1050 and 1350, moving more stone for these projects in total than was moved to build the Great Pyramids. The construction of these vast soaring spaces were required immense technical knowledge. What made a cathedral such a technological wonder? Help us out, Thought Bubble. The height of the cathedral was important, narrow and tall. Outside towers and spires guarded by gargoyles stood tall above the small buildings of the medieval city. Perhaps the most striking architectural feature of the cathedral were its flying buttresses, arches leaping off the side of the building, distributing weight down, allowing the great stone mass to move up and up. The physics of flying buttresses reveals how innovative they were. High stone ceilinged cathedrals generated heavy outward thrust, a force that had to be directed safely to the ground. Added to this was the problem of strong winds, which presented a danger to the tall, skinny bodies of cathedrals. One solution would have been to make the walls of the cathedrals gigantic and thick and ugly, but that's not what the cathedral builders did. To move the thrust out and down and resist the wind, buttresses were connected to the main building with arms, making them look as though they were flying. Capped by intricately carved pinnacles, these arched supports allowed much light to stream in through the stained glass windows. They also used less stone, reducing the cost of materials and labor. Thanks, Thought Bubble. This strategy worked pretty well for many cathedrals, although the one at Beauvais, with an incredibly tall choir and slightly misaligned arched vault, partially collapsed in 1284. For the most part, we don't know who designed the cathedrals, but we know that economic opportunities in cathedral cities attracted many skilled artisans. Each cathedral the cathedral project was led by a master builder. Rough masons cut, mortared, and laid the heavy stones. Freemasons completed the more intricate work, such as the tracery around the rose windows. These artisans were the engineers of medieval Europe, and having large numbers of them move from location to location was very unusual for a time when most people died in the same village where they were born. These flying buttressed monumental spaces didn't only motivate earthly activity, they were representations of paradise on earth. 
This paradise was part of a complex theoretical system for answering the question, where are we? The medieval Christian cosmos looked a lot like the Aristotelian Ptolemaic one, an earthly sphere bounded within a series of planetary spheres, and beyond that, the ultimate heavenly sphere. But this heaven was literally paradise, the home of God, and below the earth was hell. Dante strikingly detailed this Christianized model of the Aristotelian cosmos in his Divine Comedy. You might wonder why the medieval Christians were so obsessed with death and hell. Well, we don't want to accuse medieval Europe of having been some uninteresting dark age, but it could be a pretty rough time and place to be alive. A striking example of this grimness is the Black Death, a plague that swept across Europe from 1348 to 1350. Perhaps spread by flea-ridden merchants traveling the Silk Road, the plague bacterium Yersinia pestis killed anywhere from 75 to 200 million people, which was 30 to 60 percent of Europe's total population in two years. Ah. And the plague came back periodically until the 19th century, when cholera pandemics arrived. Before the Black Death, Europe had grown a lot, and it was during this pre-plague period that universities took off. Between 1100 and the mid-1300s, population growth and urbanization led to the rise of the university. There were more secular conflicts, so they needed more lawyers. There were more religious arguments, so they needed more theologians. And there were more people, and more sick people, so they needed more physicians. The proto-university in Europe was Charlemagne's palace at Aachen, or I, in what is now Germany. Charlemagne and his successors centralized knowledge production at the palace. From around 800 until around 855, Aachen was an important site for the production of manuscripts, including religious and legal texts. The first true European universities included Salerno, Bologna, Padua, and Naples in Italy, Oxford and Cambridge in England, Paris and Montpelier in France, and Valencia in Spain. Still looking good, by the way, University of Salerno. 1100 is the new 30. Although they all feature impressive old buildings today, medieval European universities started off as self-governing associations of people with a common function. The places where those people taught and learned could change, but the legal entity of the university stayed the same. In fact, the Latin word universitas even means corporation, which is maybe accurate today. Joining this corporation required swearing a Christian oath. University curricula or book lists had to be approved by the church. This was paradoxically freeing, though, because it meant that cities and kings had to recognize universities as self-governing. If the pope said that the faculty of a university were cool with him, then kings and nobles couldn't boss them around so easily. They could teach and research what they wanted to, as long as it was vaguely Catholic enough. Plus, universities became tax-exempt. Let's say we're all all well-off medieval students ready to make our campus visits. First, our medieval parents lay out our options. Doctor, lawyer, or priest. Those are real jobs. If we can't hack it at one of those, we can instead study something called the liberal arts. Again, here we are. Traveling around, we encounter two kinds of university. In the northern model, such as at Paris, the most important discipline is theology. The University of Paris was incorporated as an association of these masters or teachers. In the southern model, at Montpelier and the Italian universities, medicine and law are the most important subjects. These universities were incorporated as associations of students who had to pay the salaries of their teachers. No matter what school we choose, we will need our books. Our scholastic curriculum revolves around a few core texts, including some names we've already encountered, the famous physicians, Aristotle, especially the physics, Euclid, Ptolemy, and Archimedes. Also did I mention Aristotle? Which books we buy depends on what we're going to study. The artist liberalis, or liberal arts, are divided up into a group of three, the trivium, or tools for thinking, which are grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and a group of four, the quadrivium, or specific subjects, which are arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. If we decide to study medicine, we will read and reread sayings attributed to Hippocrates, Aristotle, Galen, Ibn Sina, Al-Razi, Ibn Rushd, and maybe a few Latin writers, maybe Trota and an amazing abbess called Hildegard of Bingen. She taught about human health as connected to the green health of the living environment. Hildegard way ahead of her time. Our teacher's lectures serve as commentary on the canonical texts, and there is some emphasis on learning from experience by visiting apothecaries, shadowing doctors on their rounds, and attending anatomical dissections. 
of criminals. This section, everybody's favorite class. Although our liberal arts or medical curricula are taught more or less as finished sets of knowledge, this isn't to say that no one can make new knowledge. It just has to enter the classroom as part of an ongoing discussion with the long dead masters. And enter it does. By 1200, translations of classical Greek works lost to the Latin and Romance-speaking northwest of Eurasia came back into the libraries of universities and monasteries. These were Latin translations of the Arabic translations we mentioned back in episode 7. What was the result of all this book learning? For one, medieval Christians had to work harder and harder to reconcile scientific works by their favorite Greek and Arabic masters with a Christian worldview. Increasingly, the faculty, thinking systematically about thinking as separate from the Bible, ran afoul of the church. In 1277, the Bishop of Paris officially condemned 219 Aristotelian errors, meaning that anyone teaching certain ideas from Greek philosophies would be ex communicated. Historians are split on how this affected science. On the one hand, the suppression of Aristotle's ideas sounds bad, but on the other, the condemnation freed up medieval thinkers in continental Europe to look beyond the so-called masters. Thought experiments on how nature might really work regardless of the Bible or Aristotle flourish. Separating the study of a thing called nature out from that of a perfect god, even hypothetically, helped set the stage for a secular scientific program. Nature became God's delegate, an intermediary force between God and humanity, something to study and ultimately control. Control of nature meant first putting it in the right order, head before toes, first causes before final ones universals before specifics, and abstractions before particulars. This neat Aristotelian order married to a Christian interpretation of the world based on scripture would soon come up against theories drawn from meticulous record-keeping regarding natural phenomena, such as astronomical data, such as how heavenly bodies move. But that's next time when we will meet a certain mathematician who attended four great universities, Krakow, Bologna, Padua, and Ferrara, Nicholas Copernicus. Crash Course History of Science is filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney studio in Missoula, Montana, and it's made with the help of all of these nice people, and our animation team is Thought Cafe. Crash Course is a Complexly production. If you want to keep imagining the world complexly with us, you can check out some of our other shows, like SciShow Kids, The Art Assignment, and The Financial Diet. And if you would like to keep Crash Course free for everybody forever, you can support this series at Patreon, a crowdfunding platform that allows you to support the content that you love and that you think is good for the world. Thank you to all of our patrons for making Crash Course possible with their continued support.